faith. By definition, it's something that is felt with strong conviction without tangible evidence of its existence. Many claim to have it, but how do we attain it? It can't be held. It can't be sold. But it can be passed down. Faith is invaluable to those who feel it. How is it that this belief can unite us regardless of our differences? It's because of conviction, that feeling inside that links so many, from the far corners of the earth to the closest reaches of our neighborhoods. Faith is all around us. Faith springs from a glorious past forward to a promising future. The faith that those who not so quietly defeated rivals and redefined record books would inspire their brethren of today to reach such epic accomplishments. And all along, there are those who cheer. In their minds, they envision. In their hearts, they believe. And because of that, they are simply known as the faithful. There was a great quote about Frank Sinatra that said, it's Frank's world, we're just living in it. And it felt like when you travel with the Grateful Dead that it was the Grateful Dead's world except that almost everybody was welcome to live in it. It was truly remarkable. I was born in San Francisco and raised on the peninsula. I uh, spent the first couple of years in San Francisco on Upper Broadway. My dad was a 49er fan and I was a pathological 49er fan from about the age of eight. From well before I could understand the complexity of football. It all began for Bob Weir, the same way it begins for most of us. There's a spark, a connection. We may not even recognize it's there, but its existence is real. For this iconic American musician, about the time when he was realizing his passion for the game, he was realizing another passion, one that he recognized as an immediate calling. When I was a little kid, I had a nanny who would put me in front of my folks' record player. One day, my, uh, my nanny sat me down and put on Mario Lanza singing, Love is the Greatest Thing. And I thought, that was remarkable. That guy really got some pipes. That guy obviously is having a great time. I could hear it in his voice that he was having a great time singing. I sort of, at that point, dropped all my notions about being a fireman or a police chief when I grew up and I'm going to sing and I'm going to make music and stuck with me. Love is the greatest thing, the oldest yet, the latest thing. I went through a number of, of, of instruments. I went through piano and trumpet. I finally got to guitar and it was portable and you could use it to accompany singing. You can't, you can't sing and play the trumpet at the same time. Not real well, at least. One night, I was walking with a couple of friends in the back streets of Palo Alto, and I met Jerry. Jerry was in the back of a music store. We heard banjo playing coming from the music store, and we knew who it was. We knew it was Jerry. He was a local banjo player. And so we just knocked on the door and kind of invited ourselves in. You know, hi, what's up? Well, I'm just waiting for my students here. Well, Jerry, it's New Year's Eve. Yeah, and it's 7.30 in the evening, and I don't think they're coming. He figured, oh, yeah, I guess you're right about that. Well, you guys play instruments? Yeah. Well, I got the keys to the front of the shop. I'll go grab a couple of guitars. We sat there and played for a while, and we decided it was too much fun to just walk away from, so Jerry uh, suggested as we were parting that evening, well, why don't we start a band? One thing led to another. Yeah, and I found myself in a band with Jerry Garcia. It was a, a folk ensemble, a jug band, called Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Champions. And we did pretty damned well for about a year. During that year, the Beatles hit the airways in, in America. After watching those guys and listening to it, the electric instruments were looking pretty damned attractive. We just turned our band electric. It worked out well for us. That fateful night would work out well for these young Californians, as well as aficionados of music around the world. A band was created, and those local minstrels lacked neither talent nor drive. But they did lack one important component, 
a name. We came up with a lot of stuff, but nobody, we couldn't all decide on something. And uh, I feel in a fit of pique, opened up a dictionary and flipped through it. And Jerry got up and, and uh, basically stuck his finger in and, and we came up with the Grateful Dead. Like, I didn't like the name, but uh, <laughs> I was outvoted. I was the kid. And so we were the Grateful Dead from then on. From that point, the Grateful Dead became synonymous with American music. This Rock and Roll Hall of Fame band would be as unique as any group ever to be assembled, playing over 2,300 shows to tens of millions of deadheads. Their style was what set them apart, but it was their philosophies that made them legends. When they walked out on stage, tens of thousands of people would go absolutely bananas. There was no visual show. They didn't even move. Bobby would occasionally do a little dip there, but I mean, you know, Keith Richards, now, in his 70s, moves more than Bobby did. Jerry never moved, he just stood there and, except for his fingers, that was kind of important, they moved. So there was no flash, there was no pretense, there was no theater. The, all the theater was inside the music. The Grateful Dead are gonna be remembered for a couple of different things. One is that you know, in the middle 1960s, there was a social upheaval in the Bay Area in which a lot of people made a great deal of effort to seek higher and better values than just making a living, to live a, a, a more thoughtful life. And the Grateful Dead embodied those values and created a community, a community that now, almost 20 years after Jerry died, is still something that millions of people still feel very powerfully. They're the first band in history to this day that combines rock and roll, that is to say, the, the sort of shape of rock and roll and instruments and things like that, with jazz improvisation, true improvisation. Not, we got a soloist over here, but everybody else is holding down the basic groove. They experimented with improvisation the way nobody else ever did. Really wildly free improvisation. With Grateful Dead, you hadn't a clue what was gonna come next. They never did do a, a, a show the same way twice, because what they were doing was sort of introducing you to the interior of their minds. Truly remarkable and truly unique, and we won't see anything like them again. When I was playing in school, where I kind of excelled was middle linebacker. So I was that and like third string quarterback. I used to warm up the receivers and that was about it. I had a decent arm, but I was always too young. By the time I got old enough to be a second or first string quarterback, I was out of school. I'd run off with a rock and roll band, which worked out for me, all except for my football career. 50 years ago, Bob Weir and three other young men from the Palo Alto area did run off with a rock band. Little did they know that band would become one of the most identifiable bands in rock lore. The Grateful Dead's run lasted from 1965 to 1995, but their legacy continues on indefinitely. It was the values that they embodied that catapulted them to such heights, and their ability to play together kept them there. I love playing in bands. Everybody has to feel each other and work with each other and improvise as one. Any of the other greats in 49er history had something of that quality. They love the game for what football is. It's such a complex sport. You need your buddies to do exactly what, what you know they're gonna do. You have to improvise in a way that your other guys are gonna understand it and be able to intuit what you're gonna be doing. And that's what makes greatness. And the, the 49ers were able to achieve that. That's when football gets really good. It's glorious to watch. Back to throw. In trouble. He's going to be sacked. No, gets away. He runs. Gets away again. Goes to the 40. Gets away again. Turns it 35. Cuts back at the 30. Turns it 20. The 50. The 10. He dies. Touchdown, 49ers. The 49ers. Much like the 49ers, Bob Weir and the Grateful Dead had their moments when the script was written and executed. But their real bread and butter, the reason millions of fans flocked and followed around this Bay Area band, was because of their ability to improvise. Their legacy is this. They took what I call rock modalities, which is to say electricity, rock instruments, but they injected in it a level of improvisation that, that's beyond even a lot of jazz that allowed them to explore things, to take a song apart 
and put it back together again in front of your eyes in a truly remarkable way so that people would go to 10 shows in a row and know they weren't crazy. They went because every night was an adventure. Every night was magic. Athletes and musicians seem to have a huge bond with each other because I think the joke is all athletes want to be rock stars and all rock stars want to be athletes. There's something about that performance at the highest level in front of a huge crowd live that they connect on. Well, we're all performers, athletes, musicians. We go from gig to gig, game to game. We're trying to exceed our capabilities. And when we do that, that becomes our new norm and then we have to exceed that. So there, there's that similarity to be sure. Currently, Bob's unpredictable nature has culminated in a different venture. His studio, TRI, is the ultimate playpen for musicians. Music comes alive as it's recorded and broadcast as studio quality concerts are able to be seen online. But that doesn't stop Bob from doing what he loves, getting in front of the masses and showcasing his incredible talent in venues all over the world. Then I'm on the road with the band Further with my old uh, Grateful Dead bass player, Phil Lesh. This last weekend, I went out with an old band of mine, uh, sort of a new iteration of it uh, called Rap Dog. I do solar performances, uh, just me and an acoustic guitar, play with symphony orchestras every now and again. I keep busy. Keeping busy has always been a part of Bob Weir's repertoire. Whether it was recording or performing music, he was quarterbacking projects all over the Bay Area, sometimes literally. Bob's passion for the 49ers and the game even carried over with a group of friends onto the local gridiron. He is a huge flag football enthusiast. Right in my hometown of Mill Valley, California, his famous team called the Tamalpais Chiefs, and apparently it's legit. From what I understand, he's a pretty skilled quarterback, pretty athletic guy. He was always bringing some guy from some band to play for that just spent the night on the sofa, like, come on, we're playing ball. Just give him a t-shirt and we'd head down to the field, and Bobby, who's this guy? Well, it's uh, Woody Harrelson. Bobby, he can't play. When the Tamil Pius Chiefs would hit the field, he wasn't messing around. Bobby wanted to win. I was talking to a bunch of my friends, and they had said to me, uh, oh, yeah, I've been to 300 shows, 400 shows. And I think I was on my third. And I turned to Bobby and said, Bobby, man, all these shows, I, Bobby, how many shows have there been? And he goes, oh, uh, I don't know, but I've been to every one. And it was not unusual to see Bobby take the stage at Madison Square Garden, at Giant Stadium, at RFK Stadium, wearing his Tamil Pius Chiefs flag football sweatshirt. And he proudly wore that shirt, along with the cut-off Daisy Duke shorts, by the way, which is an amazing look for Bobby. He was in music so young and so early that we had this opinion of him, this impression of him, of this, of this music man. But if it weren't for that, he'd be just a Bay Area kid, too. You grew up loving the Niners. Of course he loves the Niners. Well, I just think it's so cool that Bob Weir is a big 49ers fan because I think that the 49ers have become associated with cool Bay Area musicians. And just to know that there's a legitimate love of the 49ers from one of the most famous musicians and one of the most famous bands in the world just kind of continues that, that tradition of Huey Lewis or Jeffrey Osborne singing those national anthems and all those great musicians that have linked to the 49ers through the years. So it's funny, other teams can have great legacies, the Patriots or the Seahawks or whatever you want, but I think when you throw in guys like Bobby Weir and the Dead, the 49ers become the coolest team uh, going. What's great about the Grateful Dead is that guys like me, I grew up in Marin County where the dead lived, and I wasn't necessarily a hippie or a deadhead per se, and yet you still have a great appreciation for what they mean to everybody. First of all, you saw them around town, which was really cool. It was really cool to have them just in the fabric of the Bay Area, and to know that globally these guys were icons, people would travel uh, miles to touch the hem of their garment and yet they were ours. San Francisco, it was a sort of a blue collar, but yet cosmopolitan town. It just had a, a special vibe about it. When Tony Bennett sang that song, I, I Left My Heart in San Francisco, it wasn't a glitzy city, but it had a charm unlike any other city in America and pretty unique in the world. There's, there's only one San Francisco. Like this city and the franchise that bears its name, uniqueness is inherent to San Francisco. 
clearly one of the most beautiful areas in the United States. It also is one of the most innovative. The Grateful Dead's Bob Weir is a prime example of that. A pioneer in American music, Bob's love for his craft and ideals is only rivaled by his faithfulness. A self-proclaimed pathological fan of his beloved 49ers, he finds that Sunday, no matter where on earth he may be, are only complete when he's able to enjoy his team. On the bus, we make sure that we have the games available. We get NFL Sunday ticket on our bus, and that's mighty convenient. I can remember a few occasions where we'd take a break. It'd be an awful long break while we were waiting for the game to end or wrap up neatly enough so that we could go back on uh, either feeling good or feeling bad. I knew that Bobby Weir was a huge 49er fan, so I struck up a conversation with him about Niner football. He immediately was happy to talk about his devotion to the Niners, and he told me a great story that I've never forgotten. Obviously, if you're a Niner fan, you're gonna remember the great Monday night game between the Rams and the 49ers. Joe Montana had the two touchdown passes to John Taylor, each of them from more than 90 yards, come from behind win, incredible game. Bob Weir and Jerry Garcia, according to Bobby, were doing a radio interview that night, and they only agreed agreed to do the interview if the radio station would cooperate and put a TV monitor in the radio studio so Bobby could watch the game while he did a radio interview. So the DJ agreed and they put the TV down. So they're in the middle of this radio interview. It's a nationally syndicated interview, by the way. So it's beaming out to all the major cities in the country. And Bobby's got one eye on the game and he's listening to this guy interview him on the radio. And when Taylor uh, went for his second touchdown. Apparently Bobby like lost his mind and started screaming during the radio interview, go, he's gonna go, he's gonna go. And somebody asked Jerry, you know, if he was really a sports fan, he said, well, you know, to be honest, you know, I jump on the bandwagon when it gets interesting at the end, but I, I you know, I, I don't, most of the time, because I can't stand the extra, you know, pain and sorrow that comes with being a sports fan. So, you know, when, when it's fun, I, I latch on. So one time, it was in the late 80s when they were the Niners and yet they couldn't get it together that day until the last 10 seconds. And in the last 10 seconds, Joe Montana throws one to Jerry Rice on the, on the sideline. He slips about three people magically. I mean, he sort of melted through them, through thin air, runs 70 yards, scores a touchdown, we win. The van leaves at four o'clock. Garcia gets in the van. He is seething. I mean, I've never, you know, you can see the black cloud above his head. And I looked at him and I said, see the end of the game? And he says, no, no, it was too disgusting. I, I turned off the television before the end. I said, oh, then you probably don't know that they won. And he got startled and went, you're kidding, and made me describe it. And immediately, like, you could watch the cloud go away. So he, he actually did care, that's what, that's what he said. He just couldn't handle the pain. Uh, and played a, played a hell of a show that night. We were in Europe in 1990. You know, not so easy to get the Niners. And we were in a hotel in Germany. I happened, just totally by accident, to get to talking with the desk clerk and discovered that uh, Armed Forces Television was on you know, the cable system of the hotel. And oh, by the way, the Niners were on that night. You know, one of the things that you do when you work for a band is, is you bring news, and sometimes it's bad news and sometimes it's good news. I called Bobby and I said, turn on Channel 7, and I could literally hear Bobby screaming because I was two doors down on the, on the corridor, yelling how happy he was for the rest of the night. He loved the 49ers, but he loved them when they weren't the best team. He's not a fair weather fan at all. Football is one of the, the great arts and beauties of, of, of life, and he, he was always there. You know, if the, if the Niners went on a given weekend, I start that week off with a little more spring in my step. If they lose, <laughs> I, I kind of have a harder time getting out of bed. I'm sure they do too. Just like us, Bob Weir lives and breathes his team. He understands that like the Grateful Dead, the franchise is emblazoned in the memories of millions. And in the reciprocation for that faithfulness, he is loved back by both the town he calls his home and the team he calls his own. I understand this place, it understands me. Always considered the San Francisco area home and so I've always been a Niners fan. It goes hand in hand. I'll be there, I'll be watching.
when you grow up in San Francisco, whether you're Bob Weir the rock star or you know whoever you are, whatever you do, you grow up with a strong passion and love for the game. And so, I mean, the, the happiest moment of my life, uh, next to my own daughter's birth, was the catch. And I'd gone to every Niner game with my dad, and I'll never forget that day. You know, I'd. Uh, we had this habit of sneaking on the field to take pictures, me and my buddy Jeff. And when the drive was going down, I was walking down the field. I'd be on the sideline making sure not to get thrown off, you know, kind of hiding my jacket so no one would see my pass. But at the same time, walking right up to security and saying, I don't, because I had to watch this historic moment. And I'll never forget that moment, 58 seconds of the clock. I was standing right in between the line of scrimmage and the end zone. And I'll remember the snap, and I was trying to take pictures, but I was so nervous. And I was looking through my camera, and um, I remember dropping it just to see Ed Tutal Jones just barreling down on Joe. It's just, you know, it's not gonna happen. And I remember we put the ball up, sailed so slow. He caught the ball, and the first thing I could do was I just ran straight towards him. I ran right in the end zone, gave him a big hug, and I remember he spiked the ball. And I went looking for the ball after that, and I immediately ran up to the stands, and I saw my dad, and I said, Dad, we're going to the Super Bowl. Started crying, it was just the greatest, greatest moment.